Okay, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope uh, everybody is awake after the fantastic meal and uh, diet that we had. Thank you very much. Uh, so, fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. So clearly, we heard this this morning. I don't have a presentation. Others will. Uh, we've heard this morning. We just heard now that business as usual is not an option, right? So we need new types of food. We need to change our diet. We need new ways of growing food food for a healthier planet, food for healthier people. So we need new ways to produce the food, one that reverses the tremendous environmental degradation, uh, land degradation, deforestation, pollution of the air, pollution of the water, etc. The list goes on. Uh, so what can we do about it? Uh, what can the World Bank do about it? Um, and what would it take to make this uh, transform transformational change? Uh, to our f global food system to address land degradation, uh, forest degradation, and the destruction of the environment. Simplifying at the extreme, I think we, we need uh, two sets of solutions. One, and we heard a, a lot of that this morning, uh, we need technological and socially sustainable solutions. Uh, and I include in here indigenous knowledge, and I mean by so what I mean by solutions are solutions that are people-centered. Okay, uh, so we need those solutions. There are a lot of them. We hear a lot of good example practices, etc. Uh, which then leads me to the second point: is we see a lot of example, but what we need is really to scale up. We need to scale up, and to scale up, we need systemic systemic approaches to scale up from uh, the multitude and the huge diversity of good experience and good practices that are out there to something that add up to, the, to something significant at the global level. On that point, I'm fairly optimistic because if we look at the last 40, 50 years where we have destroyed our environment globally, we've done it relatively efficiently. Why? Because we had the policies that promote the destruction of the environment. So we need to reverse engineer to put in place the right policies that will incentivize everybody, the banks, the big commodity chains, the people working on the ground, the farmers, the, the indigenous people to do the right thing. It's not going to come easy. There are huge vested interests, but I'm still optimistic that given all the, how efficient we have been at destroying the world, we can be just as efficient at fixing the world. So. With that in mind, uh, we're going to hear today uh, in this little session about uh, two, two sets of discussion. One is a series of presentations by, uh, by people who work in the, on the ground and are putting in practice uh, some of these uh, uh, good or best practices for restoring uh, land, for dealing with climate change uh, and improving li livelihoods. Huh? And then uh, we will have also, we will tell you a little bit what the World Bank is doing to deal with some of the systemic issues and we'll talk, we'll talk about the, some of the global programs that we are about uh, just launching right now. Okay, so first I'm going to invite uh, Louise. Louise, why don't you come? Um, Louise Mabulo is our first speaker. Louise has a very interesting uh, bio. She is a chef, she's an entrepreneur, and she's an agriculture and climate change advocate, right? Uh, she, and she promotes sustainable agriculture and farm-to-table cuisine in the Philippines. That's what she's going to talk to, to us about in a few minutes and how she goes about it. But she also won, she has won, uh, even though she's very young, she has won an amazing number of awards, and she just won this week uh, one of the uh, very prestigious awards. She was one of the seven people across the globe to be named the Young Champion of the Earth. So please join me. <laughs> so let me give the, the floor to, to you. I will let you, let you talk, and then I'll come back down uh, to introduce the, our second speaker from Brazil. Thank you, Vinwell, for that very flattering introduction. Now, um, this thing I'm holding right here, this is a bar of chocolate. Could I get a show of hands of people around the room who eat chocolate? <laughs> you see? 
It's one of the most well-loved foods around the world. And yet, in the next 40 years, we could run out of chocolate because of the current unsustainable farming practices and because of, glo of a global chocolate deficit of up to 100,000 tons. Now imagine if we could make this bar of chocolate become not only sustainable, but let it enable us to save a community of people from the cycle of poverty, from food insecurity, and to use it to protect the environment and establish disaster resiliency. So that is what the Cacao Project was created to do. Our mission is to equip farmers with the right training and resources they need to be better positioned for sustainable success. So how did we do this and why are we doing this? I have to take a step back all the way to 2016 when my community was hit by Typhoon Not 10, um, which destroyed 80% of agricultural land in my town alone and displaced over a thousand households. This meant that for six months, up to five years to come, our people would be robbed of a means of income, of a livelihood, and even the ability to put food on the table because of this one tragedy that happened overnight, and it laid waste to all of our lives. The fact is, every year, our farmers are victims of this cycle of the typhoon season, which is growing worse because of climate change, leaving them to poverty, food insecurity, and strife. For some farmers, their situation was so drastic that they would resort to making a quick buck by selling off their land for unsustainable development or cutting down their trees to sell as lumber. And that would add problematic environment, environmental consequences to an already dire situation. The solution was simple and obvious. You'd think that someone would have thought about it by now, but for some reason, either by lack of education or by the systems that were in place, it was never really fully realized. All it took was a bit of research, what crops best work for our ecosystems, and what types of crops would not be cut down by high winds or flooded out by heavy rains, and what types of crops were high in demand, where farmers could make a decent income from it. And what could be used to reforest the land that's been deforested without wrecking further destruction? And then the question became, how, could, how do we grow it? So the outcome resulted in cacao, which is an unlikely result, really, but also quite obvious. The solution was right in front of us. After the typhoon, cacao trees were the only kinds of trees still standing, really. People in my community already had cacao trees, but they didn't know how to cultivate them well. And with the right tools and farming practices, the simple and well-loved tree could be turned into a solution. What if we utilize agriculture for the better, for sustainability instead of further environmental destruction? But that would only be possible if we embarked on the right path to utilize the right farming practices. We provided cacao seedlings to our farmers, as well as training programs on sustainable farming methods and intercrop cacao with short-term vegetable crops, uh, especially after the typhoon where we had to grow our own food. We also intercropped the trees along existing plantations and landscapes so that it wouldn't negatively affect um, the existing ecosystems. And we planted the trees in otherwise barren lands, unused lands, and deforested lands. Ever since, my project has helped plant over 70,000 trees over a span of 70 hectares of land. The process diversified the crops in my area, leading to better so soil fertility, and the mass tree planting efforts have brought on the revival of two streams due to the increased moist moisture retention in the soil and because of the, uh, the forest canopy that's been developing because of our tree planting efforts. The project has also helped the farmers reestablish their livelihoods after the storm and build disaster resiliency. From my experience, what we truly needed was a way to enable our farmers to, and educate them about the value of their work and their value to the community and the worth of their harvests. In the Philippines, there's a stigma against farming. It's often associated to poverty, vulnerability, and unsustainability. And this mindset keeps them in that cycle. It's time to break this mindset and break this cycle, and it's time to create circular ways to farm. What the world so desperately needs now as well is more young people like me who get actively involved in these endeavors, endeavors to bring in a fresh breath of air and innovation to the field of agriculture. 
and then use that as a means to bring about prosperity, productivity, and sustainable development. It's deeply rooted in our goals to empower our farmers and dignify the field of agriculture and educate about the need to adjust to our changing times and learn about sustainable farming practices that we can integrate as well as agroforestry. So I say it's time to dare to feed the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hmm? Okay, is this working? Okay, thank you. Okay, so now we're going to move to the second set of speakers. I'm going to introduce you to Olto Valadares from Brazil. So for those who don't speak either Portuguese or Portuñol, shift to uh, channel one so you can uh, listen to the present their presentation in uh, English. Huh? So Otto is a farmer, a real farmer. Uh, you work in one of the small uh, biome of Latin America called the Cerrado and uh, you're going to tell us how you're going about restoring land and raising productivity and incomes. And then we have a short introduction presentation also by uh, Mateus, also from the Ministry of Agriculture Brazil, that will come and, and provide a little bit of the bigger context. Mateus, take it away. Thank Thank you. You. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Oro Valadares, and I represent here my mother. My mother is a person that has 77 years of age, and she was invited by the Senar. Uh, through the ABC Cerrados, which is a program that offered a workshop. Why? For 50 years, my parents, my father, he worked with extensive livestock. In no time did he concern himself with technolo technology. Uh, with time, everything changed, like everything changes. And at some point, we were losing many, many animals. Our farm, which is uh, in Arinus, in the Minas Gerais state in Brazil, southeast, lo w was losing daily at least one head of cattle in the dry period. And this was a big consternation. My mother was very worried. We were very worried. But the policy that we adopted at the time, it was an old policy. We couldn't do anything or we wouldn't do anything with the technology. And in fact, I would like to thank to the Senar, all the ABC Cerrados program for all the support that he gave us, uh, making, uh, uh, funding us for 18 months to do uh, all this follow-up in our farm. So what happened then? We were losing these animals. We did not have uh, rangeland, graze land, and rent graze land was something that we wouldn't even consider to do from our landlords, from other owners. So we would need to buy fodder to our animals because we had no how to rent or how to buy areas for all these animals. So we had to rent fodder to feed the animals and to avoid the loss of animals every day. At the time, my mother heroically, at 76 years of age, she decided to alone, in the middle of nine to 10 men, to take this course, the ABC Cerrados course. My mother, 76 years old, took this course. She did the theory. She went to the ter she went to the fields with all of them under the sun, participating actively in the entire process in order to learn. After that, after taking this course and being approved, I was also interested in doing it. But I do not live in the farm. I have other commitments. I live in Brasilia. And I wasn't able to participate. But later on, I actually did it too, the ABC Cerrados, a fantastic uh, course. My mother uh, decided with this course uh, 
she uh, decided to use technology in our property. So we separated a specific area, which is the one that you see on the slide, where you can see where we have this outline. We use this technology that she learned. We did these uh, curves the level curves, and in some parts, we didn't, we weren't able to do the entire area because the resource is our own. We weren't uh, able to invest on our own uh, all the expenses that we would need to incur to do the entire area. But as much as we could, we used this technology, and we did it using this grading and to doing doing these curves, level curves. And we did the analysis of soil in order to be uh, able to see what kind of uh, products we would need to use in our area. And we concluded that uh, we used the compost and fertilizers uh, that we needed. We placed lime in order to be able to retain humidity because our farm, it's a region where it rains only four to five months a year, uh, not too much rain at all, about 1,100 millimeters of rain per year, which is very little for the needs. So we, ha we worked on a 50 hectare area uh, in order to get us out of the emergency room, quote unquote. So it was 100% successful, successful. In the first year, we did not have loss of animals anymore. We were able to feed all our cattle. I am going to go fast because we don't have time. In the second year, in 2017 to 2018, we did one more 70 hectare area. We were able to get a yield of 1,500 tons of a father for the animals. These areas that you see here in yellow, they were done at the same time because we first had to uh, save the amount of animals that we had in the farm and we weren't able to use uh, the other areas. One of them was planted recently, so we needed to uh, wait for the time to harvest and after the rains we were able to choose and let the grass grow again, uh, the pasture to grow again before we were able to place the animals there to graze. This is the entire area with the high pasture, sorghum and the machines already harvesting. After the harvest, this area is conserved, preserved. We had to wait for the rain to come, and it becomes after that pasture, and here we have it, after the rain period. And here are the animals grazing at the time. Further on, this is immediately after the silage, after the sorghum being harvested, and you make this contact, the tilling with a tractor, for us to be able to do the coverage, not to lose any of the silage production. And this is what we used in the dry season, uh, when where there's not enough graze to feed our animals. It was so successful, indeed, that our neighborhood came to find out what we had done. How did you do it? At the, so my mother gathered all the neighborhood, all the neighboring properties, and Mr. Marsilio, which is the engineer in the area, some, someone I am highly indebted to. He was amazing and helped us greatly. We had a meeting with all the rural producers and we explained what system and the course that my mother had taken in order to incentivize them to do the same in their properties. Here I can show you the degraded area on the left and the same area on the right recovered after being seeded and planted. Uh, here, 
here we have the level. What what is this level curve? Uh, this uh, this decline that we do, you know, it's basically something to retain humidity, to retain the rain and the water, which will help greatly in maintaining the soil moist. And here, the successful result. My mother, with her great with her grandchildren and the entire fi family in the entire grazing pasture field. Thank you so much. I would like to thank GLF for the invitation to be present. Thank you very much. It was a great pe pleasure to be here among you. To uh, speed up if we want to finish on time, so Mateus Tavares from Ministry of Agriculture in Brazil is going to say uh, just for one thing for one minute, and then we will move to uh, Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank for the invitation to the GLF and to thank a little bit about this ABC Cerrado project. What Otto explained to you, what the situation in his property alone. But this project is put in place in eight states in Brazil, and we served 7,800 producers with training and another 1,957 producers with technical assistance during the period of 18 months. The result in general with what we achieved was the recovery of 390,000 hectares of degraded land and to bring very impo important data to us, which is to show that when we have technical assistance associated with training, we then allow for the implementation of technology within the property with a yield of 34% more comparing to producers who don't use this information and technolo technology. So we see that te technological assistance and information is an important tool when we bring the tools to the field and allow the producers to implement these te technologies within their areas, increasing yield, income, and uh, the yield of uh, food uh, as well. Thank you very much to all. I'm going to invite uh, Rosaline to uh, join us. She's the director of the Climate Change Directorate in the Forestry Commission of Ghana, and she is uh, going to tell us what you're doing about the uh, cocoa landscape in, uh, in Ghana. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and uh, a very good afternoon. Uh, my position now, I think, is quite tricky because um, about 80% of what I have in my presentation has already been said, so I don't know what I'm going to say, but I believe I'm going to say something that would also add up to what has been said. Since this morning, we've had very, very interesting discussions on what is already working and um, what we can do better. And um, the situation in Ghana is no different. So what I present to you is this Ghanaian story on how we have turned around agriculture to make it productive and then also to restore forest lands. What we have seen as um, the contributory factors to these changes and what we think we can do better in moving forward. Presentation, please. Okay. So first of all, in the assessment of the drivers of deforestation in Ghana, we realized that agriculture was um, driving quite a lot of forest degradation, particularly cocoa production. And I'm sure that most of you know that Ghana is the number two country in terms of um, cocoa beans production. And so we couldn't just blame agriculture, we had to be innovative. And in that process, um, we have used uh, a bit of low-tech techniques. And I say low-tech because they don't really employ so much um, high-tech approaches, very, very simple approaches, but this is working. First of all, we've done a lot of subnational land use planning. And in that process, we have divided sub-landscapes into further partitions of where we think agriculture should take place, buildings should be, forests should be, 
and we have brought everybody together to do this. Because nationally, we don't have a land use plan that tells us that this is what you have to do on this land. So it is very, very easier for people to get into off-reserve forest lands, particularly, and begin to clear land. But if we need to make any headway, we should come together as a group to agree on what should be done where. And in that process, we have had to employ a lot of inclusive governance, because everybody in the landscape has a role to play. And we have aggregated this right from the bottom up. So we have used community resource management committees, bringing them up to form community resource management areas, and then aggregating them further into what we call a management board for the landscape. And this management board then engages with private sector, engages with government, sits down on the table and agree using the local governance system, of course, where you also have traditional authorities, local communities playing a key role to say that this is what we really want to do to ensure that our lands are restored. And in the process of restoration, we have realized that, uh, we have heard this this morning, it combines people, their livelihoods, the animals, the trees, whatever is on the landscape, nothing is left out. As much as local communities have rights, Government also, in, to an extent, has some rights. Private sector companies do have some rights. We have had to respect all this and bring people together. Inclusive governance hasn't meant representation for us. It has meant participation. It has meant being seen, being heard, and your views being reflected in whatever final consensus we are coming to an agreement on. And once we have all come together to agree on this, to some extent, we need some form of legal backing in its simplest form. A simple signing of a framework agreement can do a lot for us. So different framework agreements are being signed. Different partners. It's private sector and government, we are signing an agreement. Together with the communities, we are signing an agreement. We want to hold everybody accountable. Because if you want consistency, if you want sustainability, people should be made accountable. It is not just enough to come up with plans and leave the room. Somebody should be made to account. Now, in the application of these um, different techniques, we have observed changes. One of the significant changes is that people are coming together for a common good, for a greater good. Private sector is willing to be engaged because we are understanding their language. A lot of people see private sector as coming on board with financial resources. It's not just about the money. Private sector is engaged in business, whatever level of private sector you consider it. There should be a return on investments. Government is understanding this language because we can't always depend on subsidies. Somebody is in business, some investment has been made, and so there should be some recuperation. Local authorities and traditional authorities are also saying that Yes, we are going to take radical action. We live with these resources. We can't just wait for somebody from the outside to tell us what to do. We are also rising up to the occasion. So we have instances, in, um, instances where traditional authorities are helping us identify illegal farms that are in forest reserves and putting in place a comprehensive mechanism to get these farms out of the forest reserves without compromising the livelihoods of the people. And so there are safeguards measures that are put in place. This is something that we didn't have initially. In that same process, government is becoming more proactive. And so, sorry, government is becoming more proactive. We see a lot more of land being restored. And this is um, a natural forest area. You could see from the first picture that there were a lot of significant sorry, gaps. But then in the second picture, we are closing this up with enrichment planting. This is very, very important for us. This is government leading this initiative together with all the other stakeholders. As I said, private sector is also coming up. And as private sector is becoming more engaged, they are coming up with different, different approaches that bring more extension services to farmers, um, coming up with different intensification approaches where you can use um, that same small piece of farmland to increase your production yield. And in that sense, we have also had a lot of productivity going up. And you can see from this particular cocoa farm, the pots are quite rich. Every tree in there is fruiting at maximum capacity. And we also have shade trees in the cocoa farm, which is very, very important for me to mention here. Now, as this change is going on, we have asked ourselves different questions. What do we need to maintain this change? Um, this is happening through a lot of different 
incentives or different programs or different projects that have come together in a small landscape. Whatever I've told you is engaging just about um, 30 to 40,000 farmers. We have over 800,000 farmers in terms of cocoa farmers in, in Ghana for that particular high forest zone or that particular landscape. And the forest investment program under the World Bank is delivering some results. Um, the Cocoa and Forest Initiative is delivering some results. The private sector committing to zero deforestation in their supply chains. Government already has its own also policies on reforestation. But we need a lot of scale um, to have the impact that we really want to have. I've seen quite a number of faces here that I've seen um, before. Everything that has been said here has been good. And so the question is, why are we still where we are? Because we haven't achieved what we want to achieve at scale. So it's a small pocket here and there. And I love what um, Dr. Chomba said this morning. Increasing at scale doesn't mean bringing small things together. You just need consistency at whatever it is that is working. So we can have a 10-year decade. We can have the New York Declaration of Forest. We can have whatever it is coming up. If we are not consistent enough to work on what we have seen working, and we keep changing the goalposts, just because um, a new year has come and we need a different target, we are not going to get to that scale that we want to get to. Let us identify what has really worked, as we have heard today, and then pump in a lot of the action that we need to pump into these things that are working. I'm coming from Ghana and um, from the Forestry Commission. We have a plethora of programs and projects funded by different donors. Everybody has their own targets and they want to check the box at the end of the year. It's not about checking the box. It's about making sure that if it is the World Bank, resources are going to that same thing that's working. We don't need something else to just complement um, somebody checking the box. And finally, um, I think that we also need to have a rethink on what um, we believe is sustainable. I think the word sustainable has been abused to some extent. Um, and different projects have come in with a sustainability eye. But seriously, if we want to generate the action that we want to generate, people must be made to work. That work must be measured. And there should be some form of compensation. I don't say payment as it is, but compensation. So in Ghana, what we are doing is that all these things that I've mentioned have been put under one big program we call the Ghana Cocoa Forest Red Plus Program. It's a resource-based program um, under the Red Plus mechanism we have just signed an agreement um, with the World Bank acting as trustees for the carbon fund to say that we are going to generate emission reductions. And once we generate these emission reductions, there are going to be some payments. And then these payments are going to be re-engineered back into the landscape. And so people are being taxed. If you work, you get the compensation, the recognition, and then you keep on working. And that's the way in which we believe we can make much more progress. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Rosaline. So we've gone from individual project level to biomes and now to national uh, types of interventions, looking increasingly at more systemic approach. And now we're going to conclude with my uh, colleague, uh, Garo Batmanian, who's going to talk to you about some of the global initiatives that we are launching uh, at, the, at the World Bank that will hopefully help move the needle at the global and national level. Garo, thank you. Thank you. Hard to follow such good case studies in the field. Uh, the reason we want to explain here, what you heard today, you heard from Chris Newman, you heard today from Otto, you heard now from Rosalie, we need to scale up. A lot of people talk about the scaling up. So what we decide to do is, with the support of government of Germany this Monday, we launch a new program called ProGreen. It's a global program, which is to promote landscape at global level. The idea is to support governments, countries, to achieve their sustainable development goal, and at the same time, their global commitments, their various global commitments. The climate is not about checking the box, like Rosalind said. The climate change commitment, the biodiversity commitment, the forest commitment, the, sea, the desertification commitment, the bone challenge, all of those things together, if you have a landscape approach applying a country, you can deliver 
one hectare that can achieve several of those, those targets at once instead of checking the box, and most importantly, keeping the people in the center of it, because you have to improve livelihood, as it was said in the beginning, because those are those, those that either work on it or make money out of it. So we need to keep that. So that's the objective of the ProGreen. It's a global program. We started with the German funds. We hope to have other donors and other partners. I hope that one day we stop calling private sector unusual partners. I hope that eventually they'll become the usual partners. As the ProGreen has two different aspects. One of them is the landscape approach, working on the field. But you heard today, what you heard from Chris Newman today was he doesn't know, it's not that he doesn't know what he's gonna do. You didn't hear from Otto, he doesn't know what he's gonna do. In the case of Otto, he was just talking here, he did only one third of his farm. Why? Because he doesn't have the credit. Chris said this morning, he doesn't have the credit to do more. So what ProGreen wants to do is not only doing small projects in the field, but actually tackling these other issues, which are the roadblocks for your scaling up, from moving from common practices to good, from good practices to common practices. We have all the, a lot of good practices. We just don't have the mainstream to become common practices. And that's because we don't have the financial policies in place. We have wrong subsidies in place. Maybe we don't have the good fiscal policies in place. Those things affect how decisions are made on using the land, either forest land or agricultural land. And we have to work on those and remove those barriers in order, or transform them, as Benoit was saying, in order for the scale up to take place. And it's not one little project at a time. You have the lessons, and we go further. So that's what the ProGreen is, works on forests, works on agriculture in an integrated manner, but also tackling the fiscal, financial, governance issues, which are the roadblocks for the scale up. The other part, so in addition, the World Bank has it became the lead agency of a very innovative program from the global, from the GEF, is the call for Lure Food and Land Use Restoration Program. It's gonna be the largest program that GEF has, up to $430 million for right now 18 countries, hopefully it's gonna be 23. And the objective is to address the value chains, is work with the private sector, is also to scale up, has some of the aspects that we're talking about on eight commodities, soya bean, coffee, cocoa, palm, beef, rice, corn, and wheat. And the, yeah, I got all the eight. Uh, and the idea is to scale them up to the point that we can, uh, working with the partners, create sustainable value chains. Because one of the things we're talking about a lot here is that we are working on the supply side. But as we heard this morning, you can't compete the farmer's market with the big supermarket. So we have to create, with the, with the farmers, uh, with the, with the supply, with the demand, the big companies, we have to create sustainable demand that greens the supply chain, that we can go back to people and say, you have to do it better because there is a market for those things. They have a better price for those things, which with the assets in beauty and et cetera. So that's a program that we are, we, we are launching, it includes UNDP, FAO, and our friends of GLF. We're gonna use it for the dissemination. And since we are also managing the ProGreen, we will do that in an integrated fashion so the one has synergy with the others so that we can generate the results that we need to scale up. What Benoit said, the last 50 years were negative. We have to do the next, I don't, I don't think we can wait 50 years, so we have to accelerate. And in order to do accelerating good practices to become common practices, we have to tackle the roadblocks that, and that preventing this from going further. Thank you. I understand we have three minutes left, so perhaps we have time for one, one minute left. So no time for any questions, is that what you're telling me? Maybe one quick question, one quick answer. A burning question, a two-hander. No burning. No burning, no sorry. Burning. <laughs> Control burning. <laughs> okay, so if there are no questions, I'm going to yield the floor. Thank you.